It's a grizzly. Should we get out of here? No. We're gonna watch and listen. Everybody, welcome to another edition of Rolling the Bones Around the Cage with Grizzly and Val. What's going on, Val? Wonderful. Everything is great. 79 degrees, sunny. Oh, wonderful. Day. What's going on, Sean? Pamela. How you doing, Pamela? Nicole? Welcome, Nicole. Welcome back. Luna. Samantha. Well, we, boy, something got, Val has got something in line for us tonight, ladies and gentlemen. So how's your weekend going? Wonderful. Uh, you know, summertime, you got a lot of activity going on, family. You know, with, with both of our lives, we've got family, personal commitments, and then we got honeydews. And then um, when we mix it all together, we find time to, to put the effort into creating shows like this, which are very, very good. But we have a wonderful uh, show for the listeners today. and. And um, and you know who he is, and and um, he's he's a like-minded person, and that the people get to hear the perspective from um, from law enforcement officers and stuff. So yeah, so uh, very interesting, ladies and gentlemen. Let's go ahead and bring him on. His name's Rick Taylor. Rick, welcome to the show. Glad to have you here. Thank Why don't you, you. introduce Thank yourself? You. Oh, absolutely. Hey, Crazy Witch. Can you introduce yourself there and tell everybody a little bit about yourself. Well, I uh, uh, spent 20-something years with the city of Houston uh, in various areas of public safety in the last 12 uh, as an investigator uh, with the Houston Arson Bureau. Uh, fully law enforcement certified. I've been to uh, fire school, I've been to paramedic school, and I've been to the police academy at all three areas of training in public safety. And uh, uh, left there, uh, pressure got to me. You know, as an arson investigator, uh, worked major felonies, worked closely with burglary and theft, homicide, uh, ATF, FBI, you know, with organized crime and stuff. And uh, I just had to get away. Uh, Grizzly and Val, there reached a point where, uh, you know, you'd make a, a real intense arrest or scene and you'd get back to the squad room and, you know, doing your paperwork and everything. And when I was younger, I used to be able to, uh, you know, recover pretty quickly, but I started getting the shakes three and four hours after whatever happened you know, and, uh, right, it, it right. worked on, it worked on my health and I had to leave it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, <clears throat> I presently for the last 20 something years as a certified private investigator, uh, I conduct fire and explosion investigations for major, uh, insurance companies, law firms, and adjusting firms. Uh, I'm to the point now I'm semi-retired. I don't do it full time, but, uh, I love doing it. Uh, I work part-time as needed with the nationwide engineering company and, uh, they pay me good. It's good rat yeah. hole money, you know, nothing but, wrong with that. Hey, I, I, I tell you, I miss the off duty money. I'm oh, not yeah. gonna lie, ladies and gentlemen, oh, I yeah. miss it. <laughs> but I don't miss the BS. That <laughs> no, 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 sure, so, no, there's, there's a know. lot of that there. Uh, I did not believe in, uh, Bigfoot or Sasquatch. I do that on, on the side, uh, research, uh, with various groups and individuals. And I want to say around early 2000, around nine 11, I just, that's kind of a good time frame there. 
Uh, we had moved from the Houston, Texas area up to the Dallas, Fort Worth metro area. Uh, my son and I are hardcore fishermen. Haven't been able to do it for a while, but uh, back he was 15 years old. We had just moved up here. And uh, him and I were on a creek creek bank, a uh, very remote river bottom creek bank, heavily wooded, uh, not much around. It was open land. We weren't trespassing. We were legally there hanging out. And I had parked my truck up against the creek, and there was a little side slough that ran into the creek perpendicular, and I, I parked on that little corner there. So we had water <laughs> on two sides of us. I uh, got there about eight o'clock at night. Uh, it was long around one o'clock in the morning. We'd, we'd caught a few throwbacks, had a few bites, uh, enough to keep two hardcore fishermen interested, but no means, right. not, you know, right. knocking it out. And at some point, <clears throat> somewhere around one, I began to notice on our side of the creek, but on the other side of the slough north of us to my right, I just noticed movement every now and then, you know, a brush of leaves, a crackle of, of leaves on the, the, the ground, just subtle movement. Uh, and the best I can say, maybe 100, 150 yards away. And then a little later, I'd noticed the noise was closer. Something was making its way down, down the creek bank towards us through the heavy woods and foliage. Um, not a bit concerned. You've got coyote, you have armadillo, foxes, you know, night foraging animals, none of which other than maybe a big cat. And yes, there are a few big cats around, but I had a little, being honorably retired law enforcement, I had a little 380 auto tucked in my top fishing pocket. Not that it's the weapon of choice, but it's right. a whole lot better than nothing, you know. That's right. And so, uh, if it was something, at least I had something to defend myself and get it real quick. And uh, not really that concerned, but at some point, Grizzly and Val, I heard, I began to feel the distinct feeling of being watched, okay? Uh, I've had people try to creep up on me. I've had relatives and a nephew one time was hiding and it, I turned around and looked right at him and he goes, how'd you know I was there? I said, I felt you, you know, of course he, he kind of, you know, but right. I got the feeling of being watched. So my level of alertness clicked up a couple of notches. And then I heard, if you take a branch, good sized branch, and you hold it up over your head and you break it, the acoustics are different if that branch is on the ground and it's being stepped on and it breaks. It's partially muted. It, the, the acoustics are different. And that's what I heard on the other side of that side slough, very close after, after getting the feeling of being watched, uh, a branch being broke. Now, a fox, a coyote, armadillo, you know, even probably a deer, you know, is not going to break. A, a big size branch. Twigs, yeah, this wasn't a twig. It was bigger than a twig. And it caught my attention. So I looked over there and all I had on the back of my tailgate of my truck, I had the pickup parked there and we were in two folding chairs. It was a Coleman lantern. Okay. That's not a bright illuminator. You get you get out about 10, 15 feet away. Yeah, you can see but it's not going to light up the water surface very well. It's not going to light up trees and bushes, you know, way far away. I mean, you'll see them, but no detail. So right. and we, we had cap lights to bait our hook and all of that, you know. So I just casually put my pole down and, and walked over uh, to my pickup, and I got a Q-beam spotlight out. And I started spotting that line of foliage across the slough, uh, about in the general area, I figured the, the, the cracked uh, branch came from. And I maybe made one or two passes up and down that line, not really expecting to see anything. And on one pass going from my right to my left, I caught a facial shape. And I don't mean protruding out of the foliage, but with the gaps and spaces in the leaves, 
there was enough bleed through light, I caught the shape, facial shape of a face, not a snout, ears, you know, not an animal, a cow. It was a human-like facial shape. And I passed it before my mind registered. And then I stopped and I whipped the light back to try to get a better look. And it, it, it either recessed, ducked, or moved. And I didn't see anything, you know. And my son saw that abrupt change, you know, in my motions. And he's over there about 20 feet away. He goes, what are you doing, Dad? Well, look, he was 15 years old. I didn't want to say, I think there's somebody over there, you know, or anything like that. I didn't want to upset him. And I just said, well, I don't, I don't know, just looking, you know, kind of minimized it. But in my head, I'm thinking, what was that? So went back over to the truck, put the Q-beam spotlight out and and or turned it off went back to my folding chair now my hearing and my attention is is over that direction i mean i'm acting like i'm fishing but i'm listening and it was not more than 10 minutes probably not less than five i heard the faint rustle and you know swish of of, of movement and i turned over and looked and some light a dark object was arcing out of that brush line towards us. And the brush line was probably a hundred feet, at least a hundred feet. It right. could have been, could have been more. And that object arced down. We were right on the bank, the steep bank Creek right in front of us. That object hit about five feet in front of me uh, in the water. Uh, not like a softball, uh, I estimate it to be a cinder block size object because it made a splash about like a 50 pound child doing a cannonball off the high dive. It was yeah, a, yeah. it was a, it was a poo whoosh, you know, I mean, it wasn't a splash and I'm falling back in my, my folding chair and I'm jumping up before I hit the ground. And by that time, my son had jumped out of his folding chair latched onto me like a leech, screaming and hugging against me, screaming, what was that? What was that? And I'm pulling him back. I'm not saying anything, but my mind's screaming, what was that? And I'm seeing these huge waves fan out from the water. Well, the first thing I come to the realization is whatever it was, if it had hit either one of us, it would have busted us up seriously or killed us. I mean, it, it was... There was mass to that. And I forget the little 380 in my pocket, man. I raced over to the truck and I got my 357 out of the truck and I yelled out. I said, hey, that's not funny. I said, I have a gun. If you throw something again, I just may shoot back. You know, I was giving them warning. Hey, you know, you're not you're not messing with somebody that's just going to, you know, roll over and let you hurt me or my son. I'll take you out, you know? Right. And I was mad at that point, Grizzly and Val. Again, we were minding our own business. We were not on private land. You know, we were not imposing. And so uh, I walked over as close as I could to that side slough, the bank right there. And again, I was mad. I cocked that, that, that single action, you know, the revolver into single action. I aimed it down at my feet in, in the soft mud. I plugged the closest steer because I don't know if you fired a 357 without ear protection. It's, oh, a, yeah. it's an ear ringer, okay? Oh, yeah. After, after the second shot, you can't hear anything. So I wanted to, you know, deflect at least the, the closest steer, you know, away from the shot. And I fired a round off down into the mud. Boom, you know? I don't know if you're a deer hunter. I'm sure there's people here, but if you jump a big buck deer, elk, moose, or a horse in thick foliage and it bolts, okay, there's a distinctive sound to something plowing through thick vegetation <clears throat> at a high rate of speed. And that's exactly what happened on the other side. Whatever it was at that time, in my mind, it took off like a baby bulldozer. You could hear it crushing bushes and snapping pretty good sized limbs as it took off. I mean, it was plowing through that thick vegetation. And it was so thick, I couldn't, I couldn't begin to run through it. I could probably kind of dance and juke and twist, but by no means could I run through it. It was that thick. So 
we listened to it for, you know, it faded off after a couple hundred yards, never slowed down, and then it was gone away from us. And I looked over at my son. My son looked over at me, and he goes, Dad, what was that? And I said, well, I don't know, but let's go. <laughs> we yeah. packed up and left. And I sat on that, Val, for probably a year. I mean, I would tell the story to people. Uh, I would, you know, I'd ask them, you know, what was that? And, you know, a lot of people, they'd say, well, I don't know, you know, and then they would, they would just dismiss it and go on. But I knew what happened. I went out there the next day and saw the distance that this thing had been thrown or tossed at us. And no animal I know of in North America with an opposing digit could pick something up like that. And our, you know, bears, their joint, their shoulder joints are different than ours. It, it, they're straight out. They can't rotate. They can't do what we do with our shoulders. Yes, they can slap things, you know, they can pick things up with it, but they can't articulate and throw stuff. Mm -hmm. it, it, and it takes an opposing digit. So I came to the conclusion, yeah, there's, there's animals that probably have, you know, that kind of strength, but they don't have the, the coordination and dexterity to do that. And I don't know of anybody human, uh, Olympian that could throw that kind of mass that far. Mm -hmm. So I was pretty much puzzled until I guess I was surfing the web and I came across a, a thread there that said fishermen attacked at night uh, near Possum Kingdom Lake, which is west of here by maybe 100, 150 miles, same you know, latitude or, or, you know, same north side of Texas, but west of us by 100, 150 miles. Well, <clears throat> boom, I followed that thread, which was led me to the BFRO website, um, read the story about these fishermen being driven out of a fishing spot, and Grizzly, there was so much. Now, there was multiple rocks thrown at them, but there was so much that was very similar to what I experienced. And I'm going, you got to be kidding. Bigfoot? That's over in Pacific Northwest, you know, and it, it, the typical mindset that people have. They're there, but not here. Um, at that point, I began to talk to people, and I did this much. I n found a, a, a ranch that was on a neighboring side of the woods there, uh, that was, you know, on the other side of the woods. And I I wrote a letter to them saying that, you know, I introduced myself. I have, I, and I still have a uh, P.O. box for my business uh, correspondence. You know, it's, it's what I call discoverable. If I ever have to testify in court, mm -hmm. uh, I don't have to worry about right, somebody right. getting, getting mad and coming to my house and threatening me and my family for what I testified about you know, in a fire loss or something. Well, I sent that letter to them, you know, with my, my PO box uh, address. And I just basically said, look, I was fishing along the Creek there west of your house, had some very unusual things happen out there. I just want to know, have you ever heard or saw anything in the woods behind your house that was unusual and you couldn't explain? Well, guess what? I got a reply from their son who was out there playing basketball on one of their basketball courts. And he went in and he said, well, we've heard a, a number of things, but there was a fight. He said there was this fighting, growling, screaming. Obviously, two, two subjects out there were fighting. Uh, he could hear breaking, you know, things, uh, trees, branches, and a big old fight with roaring and screaming. and Finally, it ended and scared him to death, you know. And, you know, this is just a random deal. And here I'm thinking, man, there, there, there may be something to this. Uh, I sent a uh, report in. BFRO website has a citing report form that you can fill out. Uh, I filled it all out. I sent it in and I said, yeah, I probably never hear anything from anybody. Well. 
lo and behold, I get a call about uh, two or three days later from a man, uh, identifies himself, says he's a, an investigator with the BFRO. And I get to talking to him and I basically ask him the question. I said, uh, is there anything like that happening on that waterway, that watershed area? And he says, yeah, as a matter of fact, I've, I've got a couple other reports from fishermen uh, with similar stories to yours. And I go, you got to be kidding me, really? And I could hear public safety uh, radio traffic in the background. And I just stopped and I said, uh, are you a police officer? <laughs> you know, and he paused, you know, and he said, well, yeah. He said, uh, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm an officer with the Veterans Administration, you know, police, veterans, you know, VA police. And he said, why do you ask? I said, well, I can hear that radio, you know, that radio traffic in the background. He goes, yeah. He said, I'm taking a break to call you. But uh, we talked. He was very knowledgeable. Uh, his, his career, you know, basically told me he wasn't a loose cannon, you know, or not that cops are totally, you know, have their, you know, head screwed on straight, but credibility to him. Long story short, we did field uh, 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 studies out there, some some with him, some with a, another friend, and uh, we were followed, paralleled, had stuff thrown at us, had stuff break, and I eventually, not in that area, in the area where I had the, you know, the rock thrown, I did run in, run into what I would call a curtain of, uh, of stink. Okay. Me and another researcher were walking and it was like a light switch grizzly. I mean, it didn't come on, you know, subtly. We reached a point, we saw, saw this little bridge of trees across a little waterway. And when we got close to it, it was like they they turned the light the light switch on with the stink. It it smelled like something dead, sewer water, and a wet dog all mixed up into one. Very mm. very very putrid, you know. And uh, I looked at him. I said, "Do you smell that?" And he said, "Yeah." I said, "Where is it coming from?" I said, "I don't know, but let's go. Let's back back out of here." And it it went away grizzly as fast as it came upon us once we got out of that area but in in another area where we had stuff thrown i had my first visual sighting it was along one of the creeks there uh it's the east trinity river watershed in in north texas uh some of it's in rockwall some of it's in collin county and uh i saw this subject the way I, I, I saw him, I was looking at another field researcher and they were explaining to me, when you get in certain areas, it's good to face each other and appear like you're conversing with one another when actually, Grizzly, you're looking over their shoulders and scanning, right. scanning and panning the foliage and the lines of cover behind them. You know, and I've, I've noticed and I've got a picture of when you turn and look their direction. If they are side peeking or looking out, they will withdraw back in. They're very cognizant of where you're looking, you know, and I've got a whole other story there. Well, I'm looking over this guy's shoulder and I see a glint. It was late morning. Uh, sun was, you know, coming up from the east and I was facing more south, southeast. And I saw this glint of light similar to what you'd see off a of dew on a, on a leaf of a tree. And I'm thinking, you know, it's, it's kind of late in the day for dew or late in the morning for dew. And I, I, I subtly brought my binoculars up when I was, you know, using him as a shield. And then I eased out uh, to one side of him and I saw the glint again and there was a bush there. And, and I thought, what's on that bush? that's reflecting, then I realized it was a receding hairline forehead like mine behind the bush, and it was sweat on the forehead of this wow. subject that, that was, you know, reflecting. And then I see his eyes, you know, and he's looking right at me, you know. And uh, 
I, uh, the best I can say is, uh, who's the Crosby Steels and Nash guy that's got the big forehead? And, I know who you're talking about. Anyway, now. he looked like that, but now the thing is, uh, his hair color was about like mine, uh, a light gray or white, or like the middle of your beard, Grizzly. He wasn't brown or black. He was a white, a light white. And uh, I, a few choice adjectives probably came out of my mouth. And the guy said, where, where? And he turned around and he's trying to get a bearing. And I'm trying to tell him, but I don't, I don't want to drop the binoculars. So I start kind of walking to see if I can get closer. Grizzly, it doesn't work in the woods walking with binoculars over your eyes, okay? I hit a, a stump and I almost face planted. You know, I had to do the Watusi to keep from falling f flat on my face. And by the time I caught my balance again and brought the binoculars up, the bush was swaying along the creek bank. One of the other researchers heard somebody running down the creek and they thought it was us, but no, it was the big guy. He was he was exiting. But that wow. was my first visual sighting, Grizzly. And I thought everybody that I'd talked to about this would believe me now because they know I'm not a liar. That's not the case, Val. You know, you can tell a lot of people they know you're not a liar. They're close friends of yours. But they'll come to the conclusion. They'll say, you know, I just can't wrap my mind around these things actually existing. And in my course of, uh, you know, going on 15 years, I guess, well, no, 20, no, it's all, whoa, wait a second, you know, going on 20 years, uh, I, I'm, I'm kind of reluctant how many class A sightings I've experienced because Grizzly, a lot of people will roll their eyes and they'll say, oh, this guy's, you know, BSing. So I, I'm, I'm kind of selective about what I share, but uh, uh, my, my belief is that they are a hybrid human, okay, that is very much like us in some ways, but very different than the other. Now, my grandmother was full-blood Cherokee Indian, full-blood. Uh, my mother, over half Cherokee. Uh, I show the Scots Irish, Dutch, and German, uh, you know, my hairy arms, my lighter complexion, hazel eyes, but I, I draw native blood from my full blood grandmother. Now, if you looked at my siblings, uh, one brother who has since passed away, but my two younger sisters, if you compare me to them, they're darker complected. I'm, I'm the white sheep of the family. Right. You know, I took after the Taylor side, Scots Irish, Dutch, and German. And uh, the Cherokee called them the Uni Udawahi, okay? Loosely translated uh, forest beings of the lost tribe. They never equated them to an animal, okay? If you study a lot of your native nations, some of them are very guarded about talking about the big guys. Uh, some believe there's bad medicine there uh, to share this. Uh, some are very candid. It just depends on, you know, what tribe and who you're talking to. But I found them to be engaging. I found them to be pranksters. Uh, I've yet to really feel threatened by the interaction I've had with them. Uh, I uh, 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 was in uh, Kentucky, which was the uh, original Cherokees land, along with most of Tennessee, northern Georgia, Alabama, the land of the South Carolina. It, oh, oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah. Whoa, uh, got a story there too. But anyway, <laughs> I'm not far from there. I'm northern oh, Kentucky. I, I just moved from Lexington. Ladies yeah. and gentlemen, we'll be right back with All Rick right. Taylor.
Welcome back, everybody. We're on the bones around the cave of Grizzly Gumshoe Val. We got Rick Taylor. Norma, I would have fainted too now. Standing Stones. Hello there. Hi, Norma. <laughs> Welcome, Jeremiah Sutton. So, Welcome so, to the show. I'm so Tony, Chris, The Crosby, Stills, Nash, Young tree, uh, group, that was David Crosby with the receiver. Yes, 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 yes. When I listen that to is that, correct. With that kind of music, that's one of those pass me another beer kind of music you know oh man and beer <laughs> you know, uh, i think i time, needed some in my uh, time. i'm pulling on myself now but so, uh, yeah but, uh, uh, that I, is I was crazy. wondering Riz, if uh if uh rick uh would tell us number one have you have either of you heard of the miller document number two um these beings these individuals have you ever known them to wear clothes? I've never, I myself, when I've seen them on thermal, uh, where I could see their whole, entire body. <clears throat> now, in uh, southern Missouri, uh, central southern Missouri, there was one there, and I don't know if it's their hair or the difference in the thermal, you know, properties, you can see clothing lines when you're looking at somebody with a flare. Okay. Yes, uh, you can. There's different insulation, heat, more heat here, less heat there. You can see clothing lines. Now it looked to me like he was a, a monk wearing a, you know, he was wearing some kind of robe, but that easily could have just been his thick hair versus his mm -hmm. thin, thin haired face. I, I didn't send you any of those pictures, Val, but no, uh, no. I myself have never seen them wear clothes, although I've heard a lot of reports where people that come up missing uh, were, were stripped naked or had their shoes off or something there was interested in their clothing, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. um, but I do, again, Val, you know, I, I don't unconditionally trust these subjects, uh, just like your native nations had conflicts with other tribes, even though I believe they're a tribe or a clan, uh, if it doesn't feel right, don't push the issue. Mm -hmm. uh, trust your instincts. If, if you feel you need to get out of there, mm -hmm. by all means, don't. And, and another thing, I'll, I'll put this in there. I don't like going out there by myself. Nothing, right. nothing good happens when <laughs> you do. No, I've, no, when no. I've been out by myself a couple times, and that's a whole other story that that I can't get into here. But mm -hmm. I think Grizzly would 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 appreciate this. I love Kentucky. I've been there mm -hmm. four or five times with Charlie Raymond's group, Charlie Raymond, right? K B R O, right. and a wonderful man. You know, he's accommodating. Uh, uh, his expeditions fill up like within minutes and it's for a reason, but uh, they're very formal, you know, and, and regimented. Some people don't like that. They want the more freelance stuff and that's okay too. But I was in a river bottom in central Kentucky. Uh, we parked and there's one thing about Charlie. If he says, Oh, it's about a half, half a mile down the road, half to three quarters of a mile figure it's going to be two miles. Okay. You're going to hike. Okay. Right, it, it's right. not a little stroll. Charlie's a hard, hardcore hiker. Okay. And we had hiked maybe two miles down this one way road. It was one way in one way out. And I want to say about the better part of a mile, we saw one fisherman down by the, 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 the river there, maybe 50 or a hundred yards off the roadway fishing with a night lantern, nobody else out there. And we got to the dead end turnaround where you got to turn around to come back and built a campfire. Uh, uh, Lou, uh, Lou uh, played. I, I don't want to say his last name. I don't like mentioning names with that. Anyway, one of the guys there played, played acoustical guitar and knocked the lights out, man. I mean, he was good. Uh, played some really good oldies, some more contemporary, you know, and sang. Very entertaining, very accomplished uh, a musician and, and singer. And I got the feeling of being watched. You know, if you go out there and just hang out, I found curiosity is the big guy's Achilles heel. If there's a, a group and there's people and you don't have to scream and holler and bang on trees, they know you're there. Mm 
mm-hmm. the moment you set foot into their woods. That's that's their home. You know, they're 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 very very intuitive and observant. And and you go in their neck of the woods, they know you're there. You know, so I, I strolled away from the group, uh, got on off to the side of the road. There was a field, hundred hundred yard field down to the tree line, and the river was behind the tree line there. And I started panning and scanning, kind of knowing where I was getting the feeling. And uh, Grizzly, I saw a tall, upright thermal signature bleeding through the the leaves and bushes and foliage. Uh, Later, I determined the height using a branch, a wide branch to be eight to 10 feet tall. Okay. Saw no flashlight or any, any exterior lighting. Could it have been an NBA basketball player out in the middle of nowhere without a stitch of clothes on or a flashlight? Yeah, I mean, it's not impossible, but highly unlikely, you know. And I was watching this subject, and uh, uh, one of the guys there, he was a newbie. He he came over there, and, and uh, uh, he said, man, what are you doing, Rick? I said, I'm watching a big guy. And he goes, Really? I said, yeah, he's down there, you know, watching us in the brush down there by the trees, by the river. He says, oh, man, I wished I could. Hey, here. And I I handed him my FLIR, and I told him where to look, you know, 10 o'clock position, just past the field in the trees there. And he got real quiet, you know, and I I let him just look. And, you know, better part of a minute, I said, do you see him? He says, yeah. He said, I can see him. He's peeking out from around the side of a tree. I can see his head and shoulders. I said, yep. That's him. You know, that's where he was. You know, he's he's back there. Well, that made my day, Grizzly, because sharing stuff like that with people. I mean, if I never see one again, and I know that's not going to happen to places I go, my passion is to share and let other people experience this, this complex phenomenon. You know, these these individuals for themselves. And I mean, I've had people their eyes widen. They look at me and they go, there's something out there. <laughs> <laughs> right. That, right. you know, I, I, and I don't make fun of them, but I say, well, yeah. <laughs> you know, they're actually, they're, they're that the truth? you know, their empirical knowledge, you know, is being fed by a personal experience and observation. You know, they're not reading it or, you know, seeing it. They're, they're, they're experiencing it. And I, I have a blast when that happens. So he's watching the big guy. And about that time, there was a little side creek that came off the main river to our right. And we started hearing movement maybe 200 feet away down in that that creek bed. And they'll do that. They'll flank you. And one of the things they'll do is they'll try to get closer to you without being seen. Uh, if you've ever seen the video that wood pile peeker, you know, that lady had that big bonfire going and one guy's got a thermal yes. and that thing's in the wood pile, that's what they do. You know, they'll belly crawl. I've got some thermal of a belly crawling up in uh, Wisconsin, northern Wisconsin. Now that's scary. That's you know? scary looking. Oh, it, it they get flat on the ground and come can come at you with a, one or two feet of grass and you're not going to see them. They're that good. But anyway... I was sitting there and I said, did you hear that? You know, and this other guy says, yeah. I said, I think we have one over to our right. And my grandmother was fluent. My my aunts and uncles were fluent in Cherokee. Uh, I know a little bit, you know, I by no means, you know, can I go beyond some greetings and a few questions and stuff. And uh, I'd love to know more. But uh, I said, watch the big guy see if he does anything. And I turned to where this other movement was coming from. And I said, Gata Uste, Dejito. I said, what is your name? And I said, did, did the big guy do anything? He said, no, he's just, he just watching. So I said, Gata Uste, Dejito. You know, what is your name? <laughs> A little bit more expressively. And I'm sure my Cherokee has English accent in it, you know, but I asked him again, okay? The second time I asked him, a big, deep bullfrog voice answers from that location, and they go, claw, (laughs) claw, which is 
no in Cherokee. No, I'm not going to tell you my name. I got a cognizant response from them. You know that is crazy. Uh, oh no! I mean, I, I, I did you hear that? He said, "Yeah." I said, "He just told me no." <laughs> you know that if you know the Cherokee would leave edible roots and berries around their village, they called them the Uni Yudawahi. and and in turn, the big guys. It was a symbiotic relationship. The big guys would watch over them during hunting and gathering endeavors. So if if they for thousands of years before the Europeans, you know, moved the Cherokee out for their own good, but by the way, four thousand of them died in the process. Whole other story there. Uh, it would only make sense that if they converse, they would have to know some Cherokee, and maybe it would be passed down. All I know is I got the the response now. I don't know Choctaw, but I've got a night vision video in central Oklahoma where I, I pick up a distinctive female voice in an area where the landowner interacted with them. And that's where I had my close encounter with a, a family group of five, uh, two of which got within 15 feet of me in the moonlight. Looked like something out of a Steven Spielberg movie. I got a clear view of them. And uh, we got, I, I sent uh, Val a couple pictures uh, that I took in the moon. Well, one picture in the moonlight and then the enhanced version to show you how close he was to me. But anyway, uh, they would leave edible roots and berries out for them. In turn, the big guys would watch out for them during hunting and gathering endeavors. Uh, uh, that's not, you know, that's not a dumb animal, Grizzly. That That is something that has intellect cognitive thinking, and very intuitive. Um, I didn't send Val this. I sent him a few pictures, and you know he can share them uh, either on this broadcast or some other time. Uh, three of us, uh, a mixed-blood Cherokee. There was another mixed-blood Cherokee man and a mixed-blood Choctaw. And we were out in uh, uh, southeastern Oklahoma. Uh, we had all kinds of stuff thrown at us. None of us were hit. It was bantering, okay? It was interaction with us, and it was kind of a game like, guess where this one came from? And when we would kind of figure where the objects were coming from, that would stop that direction, and it would start coming from the other side of the, the campfire, okay? Well, this guy's picking up uh, uh, broken pieces of bark, little branches, small rocks, you know, things they were throwing in. And I'm standing behind him with my flare, and I got one up in a tree, you know, a picture of him with my flare up in a tree. I call him the fire control officer, you know, because he's got us, he, he's watching us. I don't know if he knew I saw him or not, but I got a decent picture of him. And uh, this, you know, one piece come rolling in, and one of the guys sitting with me gets up out of his chair and sarcastically says, can't you guys throw this any closer so I don't have to get up? Now, you got to wow. understand there's three chairs in front of me. One guy sitting in the far left chair, uh, uh, right chair, and on, I was sitting in the far left. The guy got up out of the middle chair. Before he got to his object to pick it up, after saying that, I heard the sharp thud in the cloth seat of his folding chair. I looked down. And they said, what was that? I said, you got a quarter size rock in your chair. After making that statement, can't you guys throw this stuff any closer so I don't have to get up? Grizzly, that's that's it. That's intellect. <laughs> that's that's humor. And uh I've run into stuff like that before where where they they uh they really amaze me how intuitive they are, you know. Um Courtesy, I I don't worship them, but I do respect their their home area, and I try to be courteous. Uh, me personally, I have not ever felt threatened. Uh, I've talked with people that have been attacked, uh, that have been chased. Uh, they felt like they were running for their lives. Uh, I look at it like this: in a well-fed area with with food and no no desperation on their part 
uh, they keep to themselves. Now, even humans in a state of starvation have reverted to cannibal, cannibalism. That is correct. Yeah. I'm, I'm thinking in some remote areas. I do know that if you have a lot of young ones and family groups, they do not tolerate a rebel rouser and a violent. They don't want any drama if you've got a family group and, and stuff around. If you've got a rogue causing trouble, they'll do one of two things with them. They'll either kill them mm -hmm. or drive them away. So, I uh, I, and this again, it's not a proven scientific fact, but I think in your far more remote areas are where these rogues have been driven away from, you know, towns and stuff where, <clears throat> where others might be dwelling. And you stand a greater chance probably in these remote areas of running into a rogue that you want. I, I think you see those all over. You see those within the suburbs on the fringes of uh, rural areas. There are a lot of reports that would point to the same truth, uh, Rick. Yep. That uh, they don't want the attention. In fact, uh, after examining some of these missing persons cases, um, there have been a few instances where the Bigfoot Sasquatch have gone out of their way to take that, that, that child, that missing individual and yes, place sir. in a place where they can be found rapidly. Because, Absolutely. And, and I, what I noticed about this also was this occurs a lot of times when uh, there's a massive response, when there's a lot of helicopter, where there's a lot of vehicle traffic, when there's a lot of horses and dogs and people, all this commotion, all this excitement and energy, they don't want that around their, their, their family, their, their exactly. invitation and stuff. So it's better that, that uh, we place this child over here so they can get the, they can reunite and, and calm everything back down. I've seen this so many times. You're yes. absolutely hundred percent right. And I, I believe, I believe the same thing. I've talked to two two different adults that have been saved. I mean, one of them, he lives in southeastern Oklahoma around a town called North Pole, okay? Mm -hmm. It's a small community. He didn't even know they existed. He was out on his land hunting and, and almost walked off a 30-foot drop-off down into a creek bank and... All he could do was grab a bush and, and keep from falling, but he didn't have the strength to get back up. He began yelling and screaming for help, and he knew the chances of a, a neighbor three quarters you know, or a mile away of hearing him was slim to none. But after screaming and yelling for about 10, 15 minutes and getting tired, at some point he, he wouldn't be able to hold on long, uh, he began to hear movement up there on the, the, you know, the top and uh, he said, hey, I'm over here, man. Come help me. I'm, I'm you know, I'm going to fall. And they didn't answer, but he heard movement come closer. And then he said, all of a sudden, this big, hairy arm thrust through the bush, got up under his armpit and picked him up like a person would a little baby. <laughs> I mean, he was over 200 pounds and this this subject picked him up by one arm. OK, lifted him up over the bushes and put him back on flat ground right in front of him. He still had his rifle, you know, slung over his shoulder. And that thing looked him in the face and went hey. <laughs> and then turned around and strolled off back into the woods. He was sitting there dumbfounded, you know, that he actually had these things living on his land and. After that, uh, he had no problems. I mean, he'd leave goodies out for him. You know, he'd see him occasionally. and No drama at all, Val, you know, or, or Grizzly. And he would not it, he would not share that with third, you know, outside third parties. Right, he didn't want right. anybody messing with him. But I've run across people that, that have uh, uh, had them on their land. That's how I had my close encounter with mm. the family group, you mm. know. Well, and, I keep track of, you know, in the databases and the information that I look at, I keep track of uh, gunfire incidents, reports of gunfire. I, I keep track of 
reports of aggressive uh, Bigfoot Sasquatch. And I got to tell you, uh, incidentally, uh, beyond those two uh, specific uh, subsets, I look at uh, Good Samaritan acts involving Bigfoot Sasquatch. And I got to tell you, uh, when you compare the three together, um, the reports of aggressive Bigfoot far outweigh uh, gunfire, and gunfire far outweighs um, Good Samaritan acts, whether people report uh, those acts of, and I'm sure that there's some out there, but I don't, I don't have a lot. I don't see a lot. I don't, I don't find a lot of those types of reports, but um, there are some, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't sit here and deny that there was, there are. Um, but I, I just don't, I don't, when you're measuring the two, uh, Grizz and Rick in, in this, in a, in a scale, like the scale of justice, you tip in one side or the other ever so gently to, to make the difference. Um, those, when you, when you weigh it up and measure it, those aggressive reports far outweigh, uh, good Samaritan acts and, and, um, Beyond this, I, I look at the reports of, of reported uh, injuries to people and deaths. You know, no, I, we, yes. we can we can say that that was accidental or incidental, but um, when I look at this stuff, guys, um, I look at stuff. I look at stuff and I compare it to, well, if I was out in society, would would this act be? among society in the community, would this act be uh, considered social? Would it be aggressive? You peek around the corners, you stalk somebody, you peek at them, you're going to get, you're going to get uh, police reaction. Somebody's going to call. Somebody calls on people with cameras out here walking around on the streets or in these government buildings. They're going to call on somebody throwing stones at another person it doesn't matter if if it was a sweet intent or a evil intent. You throw an object at a person that has the capability to seriously injure or kill somebody. That's an that's an aggressive act. You go up on someone's door and pound on their door or try their door, try to open up their door. I, you know, I live in the city. I got Detroit uh, six miles away from me. The city limits six miles away from me. You go try to, to open up somebody's door and you know what you're going to get. You, I, you know, I don't have to tell people what's going to happen. You know, you already know what's going to happen, but that's the way it is. Those are aggressive acts. Uh, you can, you can chalk it up as uh, stupidity or ignorance, but when you're looking at Sasquatches and Bigfoots and people call them people, and, and I, quite frankly, I, you know, I see them as an enigma. They're not human and they're not really primates. There's some, there's something in this, in the middle of those two. And that's why to me, they're, they're an enigma. They're just a mystery. And we, and we may never know what they really are, <clears throat> but we, um, we may not, you know, Val, mm -hmm. I, I can say this much sometimes perception uh, can vary greatly on, on what a person experienced. And I'll give you an example. I took five newbies out in a river bottom. Uh, we were followed, growled at, and had stuff thrown at us. Again, myself, I was not fearful, but there was an active uh, uh, police officer there with me, and he was the most nervous. Guess <clears throat> where most of the objects were landing? They were landing around him, mm -hmm. and I watched a softball-sized rock land behind him as we're going down this trail, and that meant you had to have jumped three foot in the air. Those, those, I, I know he would perceive it as aggression, mm -hmm. but he and a, a retired NASA engineer who was with me stopped at a uh, big oak tree, had a big root knot in it, and the man was uh, older, the you know, the retired engineer, he sat down on a root knot on one side of this big oak tree. I want to say three, three and a half feet in diameter, big, big, you know, trunk. And that 
police officer went on the other side and he was leaning against it. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know how they do this, Grizzly, but we were there maybe five minutes and there was, and I had my, I've got audio of it, a branch, broken branch, maybe uh, two to three feet in length and five to seven inches in diameter. We're talking a good size branch mm -hmm. smacks that oak tree between those two individuals yeah, didn't, that's crazy. Hit, didn't hit either one of them, never heard it coming through the branches and the leaves, but they threaded it in there to scare that guy. And they did, you know, I mean, it's, it's kind of, again, we were never hit. Now I'll preface this by saying we, number one, we don't get all the reports. There mm -hmm. are scores of people that will not tell their story versus one that finally finds an agency, you know, or an outlet to report it. And even your law enforcement agencies will kind of set on some of this unless you really pry. I mean, you know, uh, uh, you have to really dig sometimes or, or even submit a FOIA to get mm -hmm. anything out of them. But uh, I, I was uh, uh, in an area of Oklahoma uh, where we were there. We were invited. We were on land. Uh, I was with another individual, that lady that that has the the family or clan, you know, living around her 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 uh, uh, area, her property. We were in another location, but she came up the trail, and I was with my wife, my best buddy from childhood, and my wife's cousin. There were four of us, and we were going down the trail, and this lady was coming up. She said, there's one down there right off the trail to your right. So we're walking down this hill and I'm looking over and sure enough, I see this knot on the side of a tree. I, I, if you if you know where to look, a side peeker, they're very discreet, but they, they, they'll be just a little bump. And if you watch it, you'll see it fade away and then it'll come back. And they're using one eye to look at you and their hair usually blends in with the tree. And I said, wait, wait, wait. You know, I was trying to get a visual for my wife and, and the two other people, I got off the trail and I started walking towards it. And my buddy uh, did this very good owl, I mean, uh, dove call. Okay. And I seen the, 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 uh, you know, I seen the side peeker, you know, looking out over the tree and uh, all of a sudden I hear this, this growl. I've never been growled at, but I heard the growl, you know, and I stopped. I look back at my friend. I said, do that again, you know, and within five or 10 seconds, it was a, I mean, it was more expressive and I'm not a dummy. It was, look, don't bug me. Get out of here or back off. You was know? that a friendly growl? Or no, was that no, no, no. I, 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 I perceived it as don't come any closer mm -hmm. and I'm not a dummy. <laughs> we we turned around and, and started out of there. And when I looked up there, my best buddy was halfway up the hill, man. He didn't need anybody to tell him he was running. I said all that to say this. I found out later that within a quarter to a half a mile is where another agency that I will not name uh, that have, have conducted years of field research with the intent of what they call harvest a specimen yeah, for yeah. science. I won't, yeah. they know who they are. And if any of them is mm -hmm. listening here, they'll know who I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, they mm -hmm. had taken a shot at one with a shotgun about a month before in that same general area. And they found blood. They got blood off a rock. They did hit it. They didn't take it down. It got away. Mm -hmm. My statement is this, Val in Grizzly. If some ignorant, you know, redneck thinks he's going to go out and harvest or kill a Bigfoot for science or a million dollar bounty or whatever, people have to consider the collateral damage it may cause or occur. If you take one out and they know that the light-skinned, hairless ones killed one of theirs, what do you think is going to happen to the neighboring yeah. farmers, the, the, the children and people? I yeah. know Native nations, when they lost a member, they didn't care who it was they killed. As long as it was a, a member of the opposing party, 
they were going to kill him for hold retribution. That, hold, and, Rick, hold hold that thought for a minute. All right. and, and this goes into baiting and gifting and stuff. Now, I've seen a photo of yours and all of the photos that, I, that I've seen that you have, have offered and shared and stuff are just top notch. One of thank, them in particular that caught my eye was the peanut butter yes. container. Yes. What kind of peanut butter was that, my friend? Uh, I I think it was native, you know, uh, food food distributed. I don't think he, you know, it was something he had. Grizz, you know, Grizz our friend Brian Barber from Michigan. Yes. He he told yes. us a, a great experience that he had, Rick, with with peanut butter. They love peanut butter. <laughs> oh, they love peanut butter. Oh, so they love butter. it. And they'll put the we lid. <laughs> they'll put the lid back on so that the other va varmints don't get it. So, so uh, Brian was just on here a few minutes ago. Brian, if you're listening, um, this is for you, my friend. Yeah. So Brian had been uh, gifting uh, peanut butter for some time in his area in Michigan, and 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 apparently quite a few containers. I mean, this went on week after Six week. Six a week. week. Yeah. That's a lot. Six, the big ones. This boy from, here. Uh, can't, wow. This wow. boy here. This boy here can't eat a, a jar of peanut butter in a month. But I like peanut butter. Oh, it's good. So uh, it's it's so extensive that uh, DNR catches up with him, and they send him a calling card. Hey, Brian, come over here and give me a call when you get a chance. Just when you get a chance, give us a call. We want to talk to you. So apparently, as this goes, um, the few neighbor neighbor residences around that area had been annoyed and called DNR because they got container after container thrown in their yard, empty containers thrown in their yard. <laughs> now, the banter between the, the DNR and Brian was uh, she, she didn't mention Bigfoot's. Uh, the talk was bears. You know, the bears are coming out of hibernation. <laughs> bears are take collecting all these empty, pe empty peanut butter ca containers from the woods, bringing them over to the neighbor's house, throwing them in their yard, pounding on the side of the house, causing their uh, their light motion detectors go on and off at all hours of the night. And this is going to stop. You go out there and pick up all these empty containers. And in fact, here's a great big uh, 50 gallon garbage bag full of these empty containers. Um, so, uh, that's gifting and, and, uh, some of the things that, that you've, you've seen on you and Chris both seen on my, on my group site, uh, I'm not a proponent of, of baiting of any sort because to me it's enabling and it's encouraging. And I don't want to do that because whether, whether we realize it or not, you might cause them to come around your place because you accept that. I don't. I don't want them around my family. I don't want them around my property. And my neighbors might not want them around there. So what do they do? <laughs> they resort to gunfire. And then you have a disaster. You have a problem. Right. And, right. and really, uh, when, when you encourage something like that and something escalates into pounding on the side of the house, which is not friendly, it's not social, it's aggressive. Right. And it's terrifying to some people, but that's when people respond the way they do. And, and they got every right to do that. That's their property, their perimeter, their line in the sand. And that trust is broken. But all of that is caused by baiting. And that's the unforeseen, like you said, the unforeseen uh, reaction to to baiting and stuff. And that's what people have to people have to think about and consider before they do this kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I was uh, selling some of my videos and pictures at a, a gathering over on in Fort Worth uh, several years ago. And this little boy, I, I could tell when somebody, I had a lot of people roll their eyes and say, oh, Photoshop, you know, yada, yada, yada. But this little boy's eyes widen and he goes, mom, he's got pictures. I could tell they had seen, you know, these subjects before and mm -hmm. she came over and kind of smiled and I could see she was reacting. And I said, okay, I know you got a story for me. You know, she said, yeah, she said, you've got, you, you've got some pretty good pictures here. So anyway, I said, well, what's your story? She said, well, we live on the other side of Fort Worth, kind of out in a rural wooded area. 
got a wide ranch style house with a big back uh, uh, decking and patio and big bay windows and sliding glass windows. And there's nothing but woods behind her house. So they don't ever draw their curtains, you know, I mean, shut them, and, uh, you know, and, and block it off. It's just open and, and they watch TV and everything else. Well, they started getting stuff landing on that wood deck at the back of the house, big booms, rocks and, and, and different things. And went out there and there's, where is this stuff coming from? And it went on for a while. And then at some point she realized when they cooked and they had a lot of leftovers that she didn't want to, you know, throw away. They had a little, little, uh, hog fence. They had their, their backyard and pool, but out further, they had a fence to keep the hogs out of their yard. Still was their property. There was a pond back there and everything else. She would go out to a section out there on that hog fence and she'd dump the scraps outside the fence. And she thought the raccoons and, and foraging animals were eating that. She correlated and finally realized when she didn't put scraps out there on the back side of that fence, stuff would get thrown on their, their, their decking, mm -hmm. you know? And finally one day her and her husband went out there and they found trails in the berry and briar patches and the thick stuff. And it led up the hill a little bit and they started falling. It's obviously well-traveled mm -hmm. and uh, they went up and they found an area where it had been pressed down. And if you sat down there, you had a good view of their living room and their TV. Something had been sitting there watching them watching TV. They thought it was a homeless person, okay? That, that's what they were. We got a homeless person out here. One day, uh, getting her uh, daughter ready for school, and, and they were in the, the, the dining area. She hears her daughter gasp, and she goes, Mom, there's a baby out by the pond. And she races back to the back. And there's this little figure, you know, squatted down, dipping water out of the pond and drinking it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, it looked like uh, she said a, a, a toddler, you know, mm -hmm. and she's starting to run out there and it stands up and she realizes it's got a lot of body hair on it. And it turns, oh, around, it turns <laughs> around and goes back into the brush. Some, something called it, you know, caught its attention. Apparently they probably seen mom at the sliding glass door mm -hmm. and they called it back in but yeah it took them a while grizzly but they had a whole family hanging out up there in their you know and being entertained at night by there's their a, you know there's a, there's a michigan report um of a, a man that had been bothered by sasquatches in his yard for a long time he had children he had one of those played gym sets swing sets in the backyard and um Apparently, uh, he became very offended when uh, at late at night, early in the morning, there was a commotion in his backyard. Well, he knows his kids are in bed asleep. He looks out the window and he sees baby Sasquatches swinging on his kids' playset out there in the backyard. Now, yeah. he's going to go out there and he's going to shoot one of them. Oh, oh man, and apparently no. he says he says he's got his gun. I mean, he, you know, in all his male bravado. Yeah. Uh, chest worst, all poked out. He worst gets thing rifle, he could have ever done. Sneaks outside the house, slithers around the, the wall of the garage, you know, like a real commando. And uh, just as he just as he wants to turn the corner. He runs right smack in a great big long legged hairy daddy standing right there that knocked his lights out. The next thing that he remembered, he was on the ground, sleep with stars in his eyes. <laughs> so this is this is uh, some of the stuff that goes on in the rural uh, residential parts all the time. This kind of stuff. I have talked with a man whose kids actually played with the young. Uh, Sasquatch juvenile or, or young child. Here we go, Stan and Stones. And, Here we go. And, and, and I mean, he was very matter of fact about it. You know, I mean, he was a believer in Bigfoot and we just got to talking and he said, Hey, and it, it you know, called to his wife and stuff. And he said, you remember when you know, she said, Oh yeah. 
that we thought it was a hairy homeless kid, you know, from from wherever. But they would actually come into the yard and I don't know, toss a ball or do something. They were they they didn't threaten the kids, and the kids just ah, you know, it's just some neighbor kid, but actually had one playing with their children. Where did this and, Where did this take place at? Well, I met the person in Oklahoma, so it, it's okay. probably up there somewhere in Oklahoma. So, but you know, so to share with you another anecdotal uh, a report, you know, as before a, we as, get there, Val, everybody's mm -hmm. asking, how do you say welcome in your in your in your tribe language? They keep asking me, and I don't want to forget. How do you say welcome? Well, just just say say Osio Dohiju. Hello, how are you? Oco dohijo. Dohiju. 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 Yes. Oco. A good one is Oco. Mm -hmm. You know, more formal would be Co, but just Oco. You know, and uh, you you might you know if you Oco Ula. You know, Oco sister or Oco Dina Donacle. You know, hello brother. You know, I call him. I'm going to have to get Google Translate out of my call <laughs> blaster because I ain't going to remember none of this. Especially when I see one, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be like, you know, just, just. just. <laughs> Is that close enough? <laughs> so, uh, Rick, uh, back in Michigan, uh, there's a there's a fellow that that shared an experience that he had as a youngster. He's a grown man now. And uh, he also uh, grew up in a, in a quiet little uh, farming community, dairy farming community in Michigan back in the 70s. And uh, they uh, became quite a acquainted with a juvenile Sasquatch. And it was accepting to them as, as kids. You know, kids are innocent. Right. They don't see they don't see discrimination. They don't see uh, prejudices. You know, kids are really pure. Natural. They're real pure. Yeah, they they are pure. So they played in in stuff. And this Sasquatch came out of the cornfield, which cornfields and Sasquatches are are um, very important. If you're looking at if you're looking at the dynamics, you're looking at the profiling edge of Sasquatch. I'd be looking at cornfields. I'd be looking at soybean fields in any oh, kind yeah. of field. Anyways, um, as it, as it goes on, um, the gentleman relates that they became these, these kids, these 12, 13, 14 year old kids became familiar with this, this Sasquatch juvenile about their height. They called it, they called the Sasquatch Mike. <laughs> one day, one day, um, all the boys went back to their house. It was supper time around three o'clock, I, I assume, in a farming community. Three, four o'clock at supper time, they had to all go home to eat, uh, including this individual that's relating the story. This is a long report, and and I I got the entire report, and I I broke it down into three different days because it goes over three different days. Wow! So uh, just to just to speed this up. Uh, he, after supper, he goes out to the barn, the, the old dairy barn that they had in the yard and he plays with his cars, his Tonka cars and whatever, whatever he's got up there on the hayloft. And while he's up there alone after supper, um, he hears stirring around and sees Mike, the juvenile Sasquatch. He doesn't have a regular supper time. He comes over. He comes into the barn. He scales the uh, the ladder or the rope, whatever it was, and he's up there in the hayloft. Now the two of them, just the two of them, not the four of them, um, are playing together. And he says he had a real good time with with Mike. Mike was showing some extraordinary physical uh, abilities that he had. Yeah. Swinging on the rope, you know, just yeah. having fun. The problem that, that occurred that set this whole report into motion was as they were playing in their exuberance, um, Randy, the, the young boy at the time, out of pure juvenile, if you, you know, little boy kind of stuff, he pounds his chest like Tarzan right. in front of this juvenile. It set the juvenile's clock backwards and immediately, 
that juvenile turned aggressive. The teeth were out. Uh, it became angry and screamed and threw him off the loft. He fell off the he fell off the loft uh, onto the onto the dirt floor. The juvenile jumped from the loft onto the ground, straddling uh, the young man, the boy, stripped his clothes off, and in doing so, gouged and lacerated uh, a scar above his groin while stripping him naked. Now think back, think back to these missing 411 cases where we've read these things so many times where the clothes were stripped off. These, these individuals, these victims had unexplained scratches on them. Uh, so, so according to him, the thing went berserk after that little show of, of juvenile play pounding right. the chest. It was so loud that his father heard the screaming in the barn and came running in to see his son naked, bleeding, and his natural re his first reaction was to grab a shotgun that was right inside the doorway of the barn. He grabs a shotgun, loads it up, and I think he discharged around kaboom. At that time, in a lot of these old dairy barns, they had dual doors, one door in, one door out, and one door the one door out on this particular barn faced the cornfield. Immediately after firing that shot and, and, and above the screaming of that juvenile Sasquatch, the big mama appears right there. Now the dad is facing the big mama, the screaming belligerent juvenile, and then the daddy Sasquatch comes into play. Now he, he doesn't come into the barn like the mama does. The mama grabbed up the juvenile, and the juvenile still belligerent, still fighting, still wants to tear the little boy to pieces, all over that simple act of pounding the chest. So uh, this went on and on and on, and I think maybe, if I remember correctly, the father might have fired a second shot into the air, and, and at that point, mama disappeared. And juvenile, the belligerent um, one, uh, fought its way free again. Now the dad locked himself in the barn with the boy. Um, the neighbors hear the commotion. They hear screaming. They hear Sasquatch screaming. They hear gunshots down the road. They call police. The state police shows up. They, when the state police are dispatched to that address, um, a DNR agent uh, access support because these are very rural areas at that time. And there's no there's no law enforcement backup close, so DNR shows up as a backup. So now these two officers, when they arrive, they see a juvenile, hairy juvenile Sasquatch running around the barn screaming. In a fit, in a fit of anger, a belligerent one. The only thing that kept the they say that kept the juvenile Sasquatch at bay while a ambulance, if you remember the 1970s ambulance are nothing like today's yeah, right. rescue squads. So, um, so the only thing that they had to keep, keep that uh, thing at bay, that out of control juvenile at bay was the siren was that police siren. It wasn't the 38 revolver that they carried that kept that thing at bay. So eventually that Sasquatch runs down the road. It finally leaves the, the little boy and, and they take the little boy for treatment to the hospital to get treated, to get his uh, sutures in and so on up. Runs down the road, this country road, to the neighbor's house, to the other little boy that it was familiar with. You see, there was other, there was three other boys. Right. And it runs to the closest house to where the second little boy lived. There, it held that house under siege, going to the windows, pounding on the windows, pounding on the door, pounding on the side of the house, screaming in a rage. The father of that family herded his family into the dining room, told them to stay right there in the dining room. He got his deer rifle, and eventually that Sasquatch, the juvenile, out of control, broke the window, forced entry, Climbed through the bathroom window, made it out of the out of the uh, threshold of the uh, bathroom doorway, and and was met with 
the father right there at the at the hallway of the dining room and sent that juvenile to the land of Valhalla with one blast to the heart. Once it was struck, it fled the house, jumped out of the bathroom window that it came, ran across the road, ran across, ran into the cornfield, and that's where it expired down by the creek. Hmm. So, so then, um, um, at some point, three mysterious uh, people, all Native Americans, show up at this young man's, young boy's house with the dairy barns. And uh, he says he came home from school. He sees people all in his yard with white suits on, looking at the ground, picking stuff up, taking pictures, blah, blah, blah. They took the little boy off the school bus, took him into the house. Once he was in the house, mom and dad were sitting quietly in the dining room. They had six, uh, three or six uh, National Guardsmen there, but these three Native American suit and ties. And he was asking the little boy, where, where did that, uh, where did that carcass go? Where's the dead body of this, this little juvenile? And a little boy with the dairy barns, he's not giving up. He's not, he's not ratting his friends out. So the, the, the interrogation got a little sterner to the point where he told one of the, he ordered one of the national guardsmen to go out to his car get in the trunk and bring his briefcase in here. And at that point, there was some discussion between National Guardsmen and the suit and ties over whether or not they wanted to be a part of this. You know, we didn't get paid to do this. We're not doing this. This is not right to do this to this little boy, whatever it was that they were going to do. As it goes, as it goes on, as the story goes on, apparently the family members of the little boy whose house was down the road that shot the Sasquatch, uh, those kids and the family, the adults, went over to the field, brought the dead body back to the house, took pictures of it, conducted their own autopsy, and then they took those Polaroid pictures to school as show and tell. And that's how the suit and ties became involved. And they want this body. We've seen the pictures. Uh, we heard about this. Where is it? And um, the story ends like this. Um, the suit and tie show back up at the, at the little boy's house with the dairy barns. And they says, okay, you're going to have to go with us to the bigger city. And we're going to take you to the jail. And, and we're going to give you, a, uh, we're gonna give you a, a, an injection of something. And that's where, that's where he's at today. And um, to be fair... Um, there's a lot of truths in what he says for the times and stuff. Everything correlates some of the some of the benchmarkers that he mentioned in his report and his story as far as um, the timeline and the the period that this was all supposedly to have taken place. it it matches up with with the history of of Michigan as far as at that time there was the in Michigan, Throughout the state, there was a great big scare with PPP uh, uh, poisoning of dairy farms and stuff. This was contamination all across a large swath of Michigan, and they had to kill uh, hundreds and hundreds of dairy cows over this matter. But this is part of his story. And to this day, now he says that he's banished from YouTube and his yeah. accounts are locked up. Isn't that correct, Reza? Yeah, that that is that is actually correct because he reached out to me, mm -hmm. and uh, now we are protected. Now they can confiscate anything they want on our our platforms because we are on other platforms where they are not able to touch. Now I say that, but we know how the government works. We've all been in law enforcement. Yeah, uh, some of us have been deeper in than others. Uh, can they still reach out and touch us? Probably. Yes. Yeah. Now I've already been contacted, uh, by the CIA on one of my shows I've done, uh, last year and was already warned about certain topics. Uh, but here's the deal, you know, uh, his stuff got shut down and it, it's gone. 
uh, we still have his show. Uh, we still have a recording of his show. Uh, and it's backed up on several other platforms. When I say platforms, ladies and gentlemen, I'm talking uh, besides YouTube. And we're going to leave it at that. So, because we we broadcast across many platforms across the the country and the world, as uh, we were explaining to Rick before the show. Uh, so, uh, and this is the stuff that we don't hear about that actually does happen. Now, Rick, I have actually uh, got deathbed confessions last year of people in the service uh, that were dying and said, look, I can say this, but I cannot say anything further be of more than this because here's why. I was told if I do, it's not going to only affect my kids. It's going to affect their children and their children as well. So what's the... What is the payoff here? Because I've talked to ex-military that that were part of, of them killing a Sasquatch on one of the bases and had had interaction with them to a point. And then, man, his email went cold. I never heard any more from him. Uh, I didn't get any, you know, I didn't get any flack on it. But you, what, you what won't. Is, they, they will. You so know, they what, will erase you. What um, is the what is the payoff? What are they what are they protecting? Is what I'm you so know. so we know as investigators, researchers, whatever. Uh, Rick, I don't go out in the woods by myself anymore at all. No. I used to. Yeah. After I seen uh, uh, alleged Bigfoot cloak like predator. Yeah, uh, I've, I've uh, got I, that. I, I, that I, I'm off limits because I'm, I'm the type, my luck, I'll run into a renegade. Uh, I go heavily armed, not yeah. because of them, because of what people do out in the woods. And I'll say this between us and we call them shake and bake. Uh, when it comes to certain manufacturers, if you know what I mean, out in the country. Yeah, oh yeah. Oh yeah. And okay. they will, they will take you out to keep yes, they will. From that getting out. They, yes, they'll they do will. it in a heartbeat. Yeah, I get that. So um, the government knows about it. They know they exist. They know yes, they're they here. Do. Okay. Yes, they do. Now, we as people, as human civilizations, however you want to label us, we cannot handle the truth. And we said this before the show, and we, I don't care what you want to call them whether it's cryptids, cryptozoology, spiritual, whatever realm we're talking about, there are things, ladies and gentlemen, and I say this on most every one of my shows, that walks upon this earth that scientists and man says to us that does not exist, that do exist, ladies and gentlemen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, they are not able to handle the truth. And that's why we have people that have these encounters that have PTSD. Mm -hmm. And I would like to know the statistics on how many people that have these encounters that are mentally messed up and have committed suicide over it or have mysteriously vanished off the face of the earth because they didn't want the truth to come out. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not going to get political because Val, I don't know how Val gets. Now we can say <laughs> now we can say underneath one presidential term or presidential agency, there's yeah. more been suicides than any other president in office, terms of office of anything. Now, yeah. how somebody right handed commits suicide left handed and whatnot, we're not gonna go there. We know it has happened, okay? Now, right. with that being said. You know, I already probably hit a probably about 13 red flags with certain agencies already just ain't even mentioning that on the air. But it's the truth. So yeah. and, you know, we know and I didn't ask you, but we know and you know that these whatever you want to call them, uh, some of them want to call them Nephilim. Some want to call them. Uh, what's that term they use out of the biblical reference? Uh, oh, well, Neph Nephilim was one for sure. Yeah, yeah but the, the Watchers, the Watchers. Watch oh, Watchers. Yes, yeah. the Watchers. Okay, yeah. now we know that they can alter and also, uh, what do you call it, tinker with electronic devices. 
Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And that's I've why we it. have yeah. problems with getting actual video and pictures. Now, that's why I tell everybody, ladies and gentlemen, go back to the old technology mm -hmm. where they cannot do that with the 35 millimeters. Now, with AI and CIG chat and all that other stuff, ladies and gentlemen, it, it, I mean, unless, unless I know you, it's going to be hard to even validate mm -hmm. anything anymore. And, and that's not disrespect <laughs> anybody. You know well, what I'm even, saying? Even the old cameras use batteries and they can toast batteries. I've seen that. Yes, happen. they can. But you, you know. still got the wind up ones. You still got okay. the one tens, right? <laughs> yeah. You still okay. got, yeah. Okay. Well, so, look, I've, I've been fortunate enough. They haven't, but one time messed with my night vision. Now I was with some people, they toasted their flare, but mine remained uh, wow. functional. You know, I'm I'm wow. not saying I'm privileged or whatever. I've been very fortunate. You know, there's been a couple of things uh, by myself that I experienced that weren't pleasant, and I'll not do it again. That's a whole other hour, and I know you probably got to, you know, wind this thing up. But, uh, yeah, uh, I just know I've seen the dark SUVs. Uh, I've seen helicopters, uh, you know, not not small rangers or anything i've seen the big uh you know uh, m60 what is it h60 which is the black hawk black hawk yeah helicopter. yeah you're right you know with with all kinds of sensors on them and stuff hovering nearby of course i was hugging trees to where they wouldn't see me out you know between the trees mm -hmm. i didn't know they i didn't know if they were looking for us but i just didn't want them to see me if that makes sense you know but, no, no there's a there's an interesting report by a bfro and by the way um in the in the next couple of weeks we're going to have a uh, a bfro uh, member here uh to chit chat with and good deal uh, um, so one of these reports in line with this, this very topic right now, um, I remember reading it when I, when I, when it was first posted and what it was essentially was, um, there was a military, uh, group, uh, flying in helicopter. I don't know what they were flying in the helicopter, but they were out flying. And apparently I believe the chopper went down, crashed and went down in the swamps of Mississippi. And uh, because it was a weekend, because it was um, 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 that time of the week where there wasn't sufficient uh, reactionary force available, uh, they contacted uh, the uh, Army Post in, in Georgia. Can you help us out? We need to get people out there to this location and secure it you guys are familiar with securing the scene, the, the crime scene. Get out there, protect it, save it for, for people, uh, you know, for the uh, dicks to go in there and, and um, inspect it and collect the evidence and stuff. So um, apparently, apparently, whatever, whatever it was, the reactionary force from Georgia wasn't going to be able to help. So the next best thing was contact Texas. Texas has got a big state. And it's got a lot of a lot of resources. So they were sending a, uh, a reactionary force uh, from Texas to fly out, and they're going to uh, go out there to that swamp, that location, and secure the scene before the civilians get out there and things disappear. Whatever happens, I don't know. In any event, uh, they sent some military police, I, I believe, from Georgia out there, go out there and wait in that. Uh, waist deep that chest deep swamp the snake infested areas leeches, go out there to the leeches scene. Yeah, leeches, too. yeah ticks and everything else and secure the scene find this location and secure it until we can get our our people out there to to uh, secure the scene so they go out there and this is a this is a bfro report that i'm reading so uh, they get out there, they get close to the area, area and they can smell the uh, stench of uh, jet fuel. And I don't know about you guys, but I've been on scene of a major jet crash, 199 bodies, the burning flesh, the jet fuel, it's, it's uh, overwhelming. But when they're close to a uh, uh, chopper crash, they, they, they see smoke, they smell the stench of, uh, of uh, jet fuel, 
they're close. Then they hear pounding, metal on metal. Not wood on wood, but metal on metal. And they get moving closer and closer. And I mean, these guys, they're military police, they're MPs. And I was, I was an MP investigator when I was in, in the military. I served two tours. I was, uh, my first tour was infantry. The second was military police investigator. So they're armed up with their, with their semi-auto weapons and, and uh, they're going out there and um, they get close and they see, I, th I believe it was three creatures. They seen three hairy creatures pulling metal off of, off the heat, off the heap, the smoking heap. And it looks like they were trying to pull the bodies out, the charred bodies. Whether they were going to eat them, who knows? But that's what they were doing. And the discussion among the soldiers were, can we light them up? You know, we got automatic weapon. Can we light them up? You know. And this is this is what uh, made the report. This kind of language, this pack, back and forth uh, banter, made it in report. Then. I would say the next day I was looking at, looking at that same report. Ah, there's a supplement added and somebody recanted the story. Somebody, <laughs> whether forced or whatever, whatever, yeah. the story changed. Uh, So-and-so made the report, went back to post. He was talked to by someone, someone and someone. So now the report is different. He didn't see anything. He didn't, you know, yeah, this yeah. is the kind of stuff that, that you have to live through and wade through when you're, when you're dealing with this kind of well, my, phenomenon. My, my question is this, maybe one of you can answer this. Are there key people in high places that make decisions that stand and it rolls downhill to, to these, these smaller units and everything is is there a level of our government that is a filter because i know uh talking with one guy that shot and killed one it was deer hunting in the east coast had a game warden he called the 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 state game warden game warden came out got all the information went out to where he he shot this one and there was blood there, but the, the some, you know, other footprints there apparently was carried off. He came back to the house, said, well, you know, I can see, I can't tell what it was, but he told him, he told him before he left, he says, you're going to be contacted by some other gentleman with another agency, just be expecting it, you know, and, mm -hmm. and they did, you know, guys, you know, suit and tie, almost like the men in black, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. now, my right. question is, you know, the local game warden knew about him, but he didn't, he didn't elaborate. So is there, is there higher, uh, you know, is there, is there an unknown agency in government that we don't know about, you know, that, that specializes in this, you know? I Civil? have been told we, yes, there is. Uh, I don't know. Jer Jeremiah Sutton says the department of interior, uh, I've heard that rumor. I cannot confirm that. Uh, I know there are other agencies that are. Uh, I know that there are certain key words that they're monitoring, whether it's cell phones, computers, emails, websites, uh, phrases. Uh, I can't remember the computer system. Is it NORAD that goes through where they monitor all the terrorists and all the the the, the radio waves and frequencies that spits out people's names and so forth that monitors. And that's how I got flagged with the CIA on one of my shows wow. uh, because of the key words. Yeah. Uh, that was very interesting. Uh, I can assure you of that. Uh, I didn't believe it. Uh, Brian says the operation blue book and enormous says yes. Uh, now, I do know it, unofficially, uh, I have spoken to people that known people, like you said, that hunt these creatures 45 days on, 45 days off. Now, I try to tell people that want to claim these rewards, I, I am a no, no uh, hunt person, no kill person, okay? Right. I, I used to be a big hunter, okay? I, right. I used to be a big hunter, deer hunter. Uh, I used to turn all my deer meat into deer jerk. 
But oh, my thing is, is that here, here, here's my philosophy. Val and I are out in the woods, okay? And we hear this report. We're deer hunting. I see something. I pull it up my scope. I'm going to drop it. But when I look in its face, it's human looking. Now I've got second thoughts, right? Hey, now, absolutely. now, let's say I did drop this or drop A1 or whatever it is. Now, him and I, there is no way we're going to get this thing out of the woods. So we're going to call people to get help. Right. Guess who's monitoring our phone calls? You got now, that. Now, guess right. who else is going to find out? Fowl and Grizzly's got some out in the woods, ladies and gentlemen. Man, it's going to go around town. The police are going to be involved. And before we even get back to that, wherever it's at, it's going to be gone or we're going to be met. And mm -hmm. guess what? Stories gonna are going to be changing. Yes. They'll tell you either forget what you saw or we're going to take you off to jail. Yes, that is bum, correct. Bum wrap you. I've, I've heard that before, too. They said, no, you're going to be charged with thus and so. But I didn't know. If you don't leave, we are going to charge you with thus and so, and you're looking at some serious hard time. What do you want to do? I'm going to forget it and leave, man. You know, you're fighting a force and an entity. You're not going to win. Okay? You're not. You're, you're not. not. And, and the small guy, people have to understand that, you know. My my thing is is the impetus and the power and the concern from the from whoever it is, you know, what's the payoff is is what I'm you know that that, that that's what my mind keeps twisting around and around because uh you know I talked to another guy that 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 jokingly uh said that a Bigfoot had been hit by a car somewhere in Oklahoma and he watched and sure enough, there were, you know, emergency equipment. But he said very soon after that, dark SUVs showed up too, you know. I mean, this is dark, you know, SUVs. And I've heard, I've, I don't know, uh, you know, I just, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I've talked to too many people. Yeah, there, there's, there's a lot there, you know. Uh, well, and no matter what we do or no matter what everybody does in this film or realm of Sasquatch, Bigfoot, or wherever you want to call or label these entities or beings, right? Right. Nothing is ever going to be good enough. You know, oh, no. everybody oh, no. says, I want a body on the table. Mm -hmm. But ladies and gentlemen, we have bodies on the table about St. Helens. Every time mm -hmm. there's a national wildfire or forest fire out Midwest, so exactly, we recover exactly. bodies. But we never see them. The Smithsonian's, when it comes to these giant skeletons, they mm -hmm. have disappeared. Okay. So we have the evidence, but it always disappears. And so does the people's credibility, just like the, the nut job that used to work for Area 51, Rob Lazar. Everybody thought he was crazy until yeah. he mysteriously produced a paycheck stub. And they're like, oh, damn. And now yeah. he actually worked for him and they try to erase his life. Yeah. So is it worth it? No. no. And like Val said, Val had his encounter. That was good enough for him. He walked yeah. away with his life. Now I've seen one. I've yeah. seen evidence. I've seen footprints. I've seen what I need to see in my life. And after I've seen that video that cloaked, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry. Call me a scaredy cat. You heard what he said. Yeah. Do not go in the woods alone. My luck, I'll come up with one of those dang on ones that's been kicked out of the clan that's angry and pissed <laughs> off, you know, and I'm the yeah. one that's by myself. Yeah. So, yes. So, I know. Yeah. NORAD, I get thank it. you. That is correct. NORAD, Lady Wolf. Thank you. That's what it is. NORAD. <clears throat> that yeah. monitors all the communications. Wow. Key words. Wow. So, um, I asked earlier if you guys were familiar with the supposed Miller document. Can, um, can I take a little hall break for a yeah, second? Absolutely. Sure. I, I yeah, gotta absolutely. I got to run down the hall for yeah, sure. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. So, you know, and, and that's the, and that's the thing, Val. And, and I totally agree with, with everybody saying it, it is it, it. Number one, it's sad, mm -hmm. you know, because no matter what anybody does, it, it's not going to be good enough, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, and then you got that idiot out there that's like, I love you. Have you seen that video with the guy with the that took the picture behind the fence? And now that's claiming it's a mask. What's his is, name? Is that is that Ontario Sasquatch? I, I think so, or but, something. But the, the guy is calling, 
guy yeah, is he's... calling uh, his name Mike. Mike. Or something. I, I love you. I love you. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I'm going to tell you something, brother. Uh, anything that's, that loves me with a voice like that, I, I don't want to know. Yeah. So <laughs> I don't want to yeah. know. I, I, I mean, I don't know. It, Say anything you, know, you want to me, but don't tell me you love me in, a, in that <laughs> tone of voice. This, you know, this, and, homie don't, this homie doesn't play that. I don't play and, that. And that's the thing. You know, you got people like that, that, that you know, that make stuff up, conjure stuff up, manufactures evidence, you know, and, and concludes, you know, the people are like, well, here's another Johnny. You know, or little Johnny, you know, causing havoc out there in the world. No wonder nobody wants to believe anything. Mm -hmm. And then you got people like Rick, you know, that's got and Why is it that everybody that's got Indian in them have these encounters? And I never thought about talking to them, Navajo or, or mm -hmm. Cherokee or anything like that. You know now, what I'm saying? Yeah. And that's interesting because Barry, Barry Weber you know, very cool dude. And uh, I enjoy talking to him. I've said this many times before, my, my former uh, police partner for very, very, for a long time, he was Ojibwa Indian. So uh, I enjoy chit-chatting just like Rick does. And uh, we could get into some deep spiritual, political, blah, blah, blah. Any kind of conversation you want, we can get into it. And, and it's, it's that, Native American um, um, feeling, that passion of life and, and the understanding of life that we can we can all appreciate. And I personally can't get enough of it. Uh, when I when I when I talk to people of Native American heritage and stuff, I enjoy the chit chat. I enjoy the the intellectual banter. Getting back to this Miller document, uh, uh, Rick, you and I were talking last night about this. And and I think I I think I read something to you. I think the last paragraph and stuff. So I don't know how many people know about this, but this has been around for a couple of years, and it's been poo pooed by the experts in the Bigfoot community as a fraud and a hoax. But um, from my perspective, I, you know, I don't know. Uh, there's too many tells in this in this piece of within the four corners of this document that tell what is me it? everybody's asking what is the miller document the miller document is a uh well, let me see if i if i got a uh a short synopsis of this that i can now read. you can now you can down there at the bottom hit that present button you can share anything you want videos pictures Where yeah um this is this is so i could I, instead, yeah I'm not, instead of I, instead of showing a picture of the peanut butter jar right there that the yeah. native oh wow yeah. yeah see the see the thumb and index swirl in there yeah, yeah that, looks sure like Jif that looks like jiffy to me uh, could now, be. Val, Val, would, how would you know that would be jiffy val <laughs> i don't know you didn't even get to see the damn label on that look at that <laughs> crazy over there that's esp uh so basically basically the miller document it's it's uh, what I've written on this is uh, clues and hints may be found in the mysterious Miller document allegedly written by H.A. Miller, M.D., Ph.D., now deceased. He concluded his paper by saying about this by saying this about uh, I'll have to spell the word C.E.B.I.D.A.T.E.L.I.D.A.E.S. That is how we refer to the individuals as. Bigfoot, Sasquatch, and a long list of regional names and interpretations. In quotation mark, it was written by this Dr. H.A. Miller, who incidentally graduated from Yale, I believe, or Harvard, and we know a little bit about that university, what it's been involved in. And remember, look for the tells, look for the red flags that go up when you when you look at this document and stuff. But anyways, in quotation marks, he's, he writes, not me, he writes, this species is amazing, powerful, and deadly if angered. Like any animal, it will protect itself, its food resource, and its young at all cost. Again, this is a PhD MD who claims that he started his work 
after out of college, out of the university, with the department of what was it? Um, it was a government agency. Um, but I, it'll come to me in a minute here when I get into this. He also was quoted as saying, it is imperative that the federal government continue to designate natural areas. Otherwise, a scarce food resource available to the C-E-B-I-D-A-T-E-L-I-D-A, -E -E this is the uh, scientific term for Sasquatch Bigfoot, will result in more opportunistic feeding behavior in closer interaction between humans and C-E-B-I-D-T-E-L-I-D-A-E. -E. Okay, folks, that's that's from the, the mouth, supposedly, allegedly, from this Dr. H.A. Miller, MD, PhD, now deceased. And to me, when I read this, the entire document, it reads to me as a deathbed confession, if not a uh, admission of what many of us already believe and already know to, to exist. So what is he? What is he? What he's saying here in this last paragraph is that uh, these individuals that we call Bigfoot Sasquatch need such a large, vast area for food that um, if they don't get that natural, if they don't have that vast area to survive and inhabit, uh, the danger is. Uh, it brings them closer to people and, and their more opportunistic feeding behaviors start to, to uh, come out between human and this, the Sasquatch. This is according to him. So, um, uh, he, he ends his, 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 uh, paper by saying this. These creatures and human beings simply do not exist. They don't coexist. Emphasis, uh, emphasis on do not. Now, think back, think back on, on the people that say, oh, yeah, I'll pet them on the back. I'll brush their hair. You know, I'll give them a bubble bath. Uh, they're my friends. They talk to me. They love me. I love them back. These creatures and human beings simply do not coexist. Why would he say something like that? Hmm. Yeah. Why would he say something like that? And he says, if they don't have, if, if the government, if the management arm of the government doesn't continue uh, making, designating bigger and bigger areas for their uh, habitation, a scarce food resource occurs. And if that occurs, it sets off a chain reaction of things that, that aren't pretty. In other words, the bottom line is, uh, what made me think about this was, uh, somebody made a report recently of falling numbers of deer, falling numbers of bear, falling numbers of elk. Where are they going? What's happening to these these wildlife? These are animals. These are res food resources to to a large predator like this. So wow. what happens when when uh, you know when when the numbers of of natural uh, uh, wildlife diminish to such an extent that it causes uh, pressure on on food resources to uh, an individual like this? What happens? Well, look back at this Miller document, and he tells you right here, these creatures and human beings simply do not coexist. Why? Because scarce food resources will resort in more opportunistic feeding behavior. What does that mean? What does that mean? What is he telling you? Yeah, and, and you're right. So, and there has been many people that I have interviewed in the past and recently, guys, uh, and ladies and gentlemen, that has stated that they have been in areas to where they've gone and they don't see any wildlife, mm -hmm. deer, elk, yeah. rabbits. They don't hear frogs at night around the creeks or ponds or rivers or lakes. 
Hmm. And what is that? Uh, is that a tall tale sign of a depletion of re natural resources for them? I'm not saying it is or it is not, but I'm just saying if you actually have a population that lives in the area, you know, and the, you yeah. gotta imagine these things are not small. And yes, it was Theodore Roosevelt in the National Park System. He's the one that introduced the the park system, uh, Jeremiah. Uh, but you know, they have to eat quite a bit, ladies and gentlemen. Mm -hmm. So yes. So mm -hmm. my my uh, my interest in college, my degree, my study was community development and uh, that kind of stuff. So I was interested in demographics. I was interested in uh, um, community development. So when I'm looking at this and I'm looking at uh, central cities, some of the literature that I had to read when I was in the university. Um, so the, the thought, the forethought was to push people further and further into central cities and out of more residential areas. Do you get where I'm going here? So we're going to make, we're going to have all this, this area that uh, if their dream is utopia and if their dream is, is, uh, reality. So you take everybody out of the rural areas, the remote rural areas, and push them further and further into central cities. And so uh, what do you have out there in the vast, vast wilderness of nothingness of the rural areas that once were inhabited by sparse population uh, groups is wild animals or whatever, whatever out there. So I'm looking at I'm looking at what this alleged uh, paper said, and I'm thinking about some of the things that I'm familiar with as far as the utopian um, um, image of future in in central cities. Uh, it it begins to make sense. The, you know, you take a piece of the puzzle and you put it here. You take another piece and you put it there, and and you do that long enough you got a picture. You have a picture that, that begins to appear and make itself clear. Well, yeah. things, things that were hidden once are made manifest and you can see it. So I think and that's Brian important. And Brian makes a good point, Brian. And I couldn't tell you how many people that have not come on record on the air and said, I am a deer hunter. I no longer deer hunt because I shot a deer and I went to go get it, and I'll be damned if I'm fighting a Bigfoot over a deer, and I ran like hell because it wanted my deer I dropped. Yeah. And so, and I'm not going to fight something that wants to eat, and I didn't know it existed, and no, I sold my guns, and I never went back in the woods again. That happens <laughs> a lot, doesn't it, no. guys? No, yes, I, I, I used I, to be a hunter myself, and I don't hunt anymore. I, I could honestly say that. I don't hunt anymore, but I'm also a... Uh, an avid uh, reader and collector of data. And I can tell you that a large portion of conflict between man and animal, sa I'm sorry, Rick, Sasquatch, <coughs> a, a, appears to occur between that, that, that uh, time of the season, between September, October, November. Gee, yep. I wonder which three months that that encompasses that's the hunting season in most states across across north america yes. but that's when you see the most um, aggression and the most uh, potential for conflict and, and a lot of that hinges on stolen food hunters go out they're armed they uh, they take a deer an elk a moose a bear and uh, before they get to lay their hands on that, uh, in a brazen act of thievery, the the uh, the game is taken right from them and carried away in your face, right in your face. What are you going to do about it? That happens a lot. It no, does. I, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. I was I was out in Central Texas a couple couple years ago. Bigfoot 
was not on my mind. I mean, this friend of mine that I worked with had 160 acres that uh, joined a nature preserve, you know, a preserve area where there was no hunting and the hogs were just tearing up his pastures and stuff. And uh, again, Bigfoot didn't cross my mind. I had asked him a few questions, you know, about have you ever heard this or seen that? And we went out there, and that day uh, we scouted out areas of sign where they were moving, and we were forming a, a, a night hunt game plan on where we, you know, where we were going to set up. I had an LR 308 with a, a night vision scope. And I had my FLIR, my and and with that I had a 45 Colt with several uh, extra magazines cocked and locked in a holster on my hip. And right before dark, coming we're kind of come back to his uh, barn. He got over a Texas-sized thorn that flattened the front right tire of his side-by-side -side SUV. And uh, he looked for a spare. He looked for a patch kit. He looked for, you know, he couldn't repair it. And he finally told me, he said, look, Rick, man, I am sorry, but my heart condition won't let me walk back out there with you, you know. He said, you're either going to have to hunt by yourself or come back when I can get this repaired. Well, I ignorantly and very stupidly said, you know what, I'm going to just ease out there on foot and and see what I can, you know, stir up. And... Gentlemen, I, I was crazy. I don't know, but big boar hog are not friendly. No, and they're not. They will attack you in mass, not just one. And if you're in an SUV or a vehicle, you got some insulation, but you out there on foot. I, I was very ignorant and stupid about doing what I was doing. And uh, but I wanted to hunt. <laughs> so I got out there, and I, I say I got about halfway back. I didn't get any of the brush. I stayed out in the open meadow, meadow areas. Uh, there was need a thigh-high, thin grass. You could, with a bright cap light, you could still see the ground. But I was in, I was in, you know, grass. And I got about halfway back there, and I started hearing movement uh, uh, about 50, 75 yards ahead in a grove of trees. And, uh, I started easing over there. I had my flare up to my, you know, my face panning and scanning. And my game plan was if I found something moving, I would then fire up my, my rifle scope. I had my 308 on a ready sling hanging there, you know, with a 20 round clip or magazine. And, and, uh, at some point as I got closer Still never saw anything, but I heard movement. My left hand was hanging free to my left side, had the gun ready sling on my right side, and I had the 45 on my right hip. When I was in the police academy years ago, I had to take a hit off a taser so that I would know what it felt like and how, what it would do to you, okay? Okay. Never had, you know, tased after that, but I know what it feels like. Gentlemen, my free hanging left hand felt like somebody put a taser right up on my fingers or the palm of my hand and hit me with it. I could feel the jolt. I could feel the shock. I could feel the ripple up my nerve bundles all the way up to my shoulder. And my left hand just jammed up and seized like that. I leaped backwards and spun kind of away from what I thought might be a snake or a spider. I first thought I had gotten bit by something. And as I'm spinning and jumping, I'm turning on that bright white cap light to illuminate the ground and the grass. And I panned and scanned. There was not a snake. There was not an electric fence. There wasn't a spider web. There wasn't anything to cause that jolt. It was it was like a taser. But you know, I couldn't my mind couldn't equate. At, you know, where did that come from? I'm thinking spider or you know snake. 
it about a minute of searching and my hand started coming back, you know, you know, it feels like it's asleep and then you start getting feeling. Well, about that time, I, I focused back to the grove of trees I was sneaking up on. Having that rifle slung on my, you know, and a gun on my hip and me lurking up there, whatever was in there, I might not have looked too friendly, okay? To this day, I'm not sure what caused that. Some people said, look, it was a, a big guy giving you a back off, uh, you know, uh, zap. I mean, I literally felt it. I know this much, gentlemen, it wasn't focused to my whole body. It was, it was limited to my free hanging hand. Had it have been focused to my whole body, I'd have went down on the ground like a, like a rag doll, totally helpless. Was it a big guy? I don't know. Uh, other person said, yeah, it was a big guy that knew you were fixing to stir up a bunch of hog that you would have probably gotten killed over if you shot the first one. I don't know to this day, but that happened to me hunting alone at night near pitch dark. And I will never do that again. You know, I, I don't know thoughts and ideas, but all I do know is it happened, you know. It yeah. sounds like he got hit, like a couple people said, it sounds like he got hit with Denver sound. So, yeah. yeah. Could have been. That's what I think. Could have been. Well, I'll tell you, it was very focused to my, my left hand. It it incapacitated my arm for, it, you know, hand and arm for at least a minute. It could have been more. It wasn't focused to my entire body, but it got my undivided attention. I, I put my hand up, and I said, okay, big boy, I can take a hit. I'm out of here. You know, and I left. I, I got back to his barn. I didn't tell the landowner that ever happened. I loaded up my gun and I, I left. I haven't been back since. <laughs> you know, what? what's really interesting is that, Val, he says that. And how many people we heard that says they do this mm -hmm. and put their hands up and do this. Mm -hmm. And it's like, hey, I'm out of here. No harm. Let me leave. I'm backing out. Let me just get out of here. I'm not coming back. Yeah. I and just it's like, yeah. it's like they know that they know what that means. Yeah. I put my hand up. Right. I said, okay, big boy. I you can guys, take a you hint. Guys, <laughs> you guys know the history behind the origin behind. No weapon. Your empty no hand. You're in That's right. Right. That's right. And, and these things recognize that. Um, but yeah, I, I, I would say the same thing, Grizz. It's, that was infrasound. That's what it does. It gives you the tinglys. Uh, it over it overwhelms you, like uh, as though you were under the influence of something. You're very lucid in thought. You can think well. You can think sharp, but you can't do anything about it. It's just it's just all over you. And, well, uh, that that was that was my first. I've never had anything like that happen before then and nor since then now i know in central oklahoma uh surrounded by thick woods i didn't tell anybody i had a, a 45 tucked away on me and it's in my book you know the story uh i was asked mentally it, it were words that came into my mind and it's happened uh several times before then and afterward uh, second, just a second, Rick. Do you accept that, Grizz? What he just, what Rick just said. So, I don't know. He, uh, he, now. he it, 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 nothing, nothing moved their lips to him. Nothing it was, wasn't. It wasn't audible. Everybody says it happens. Mm -hmm. Everybody, know? everybody I talk to says they know. They, it's they the actually know. I don't mm -hmm. carry nothing less than a forty-four mag. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah. I, now I, I I love my fifty A and E. If people yeah. don't know what that is, but I cannot double tap accurately with that because right. of the recall. Now, how about they your know what they are. How about your four fifty four case? All now, I want one of those really bad. But <laughs> if, if I want to get one of those, I might as well go ahead and get me a four sixty uh, <laughs> Smith and Wesson uh, Magnum. Smith and Wesson Magnum, right? <laughs> or the five hundred at least. You guys are so, devious. Oh, so, anyway, you guys are devious. Well, you know? I, hey, these crackheads out there are big. <laughs> so I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just saying, ladies oh. and gentlemen. 
Wow. So uh, what is the Native American greeting? Uh, Jeremiah Sutton wants to know when you greet somebody. Is that the wave too? Or is there a wave that you do? You know, pretty much. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, it's a, it's a, you know, hand signal, you know, international. It it, it is. It's, it's tribal. I mean, both hands is total, total submission. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. You know, I mean, even police officers, let me see your hands. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) In Spanish, they say, pongo samuna, pongo Manos, manos, arriba, arriba, you know, you know what? Like, I mean, screw that Spanish crap, ladies and gentlemen. You know what? I always <laughs> said when they told me they never spoke English, I always looked on the floorboard and said, Whose hundred dollar bill was that? And they're like, What? I'm like, Get your ass out of the car. Everybody. That's it, right then and there. Get yeah, Everybody. you're done. Yeah, so, so, uh, Chris, you were talking, you were talking about you and Rick were talking about earlier before the show, you were talking about. These scary, uh, scary, and I mean creepy uh, kind of things. And I was asking, had you guys been in into any homes, environments that you felt uh, the overwhelming impression of uh, oppression, if you know what I mean? Oh. You get in there, you get yeah. into these houses, yeah, and you, you feel you oppression. Can. Yeah, yeah, you you really can, and and. The one of the things that that he said, and I do concur with and agree with totally, <clears throat> is that number one, you have to be open minded, and you have to be, and and a lot of people will roll their eyes, just like we always say when it comes to Bigfoot or Sasquatch or Yungtunga, is you know spiritual or whatever, or waking or vibration or vibrating on a higher level is that, you know, being in law enforcement, you are taught certain things. You got that gut and instinct feeling. Now, when you walk across that threshold, it is like the air changes. Mm -hmm. And like everything around you is like totally different than what you just came outside and walked in. And then it's not only that, but the person you're dealing with or the family or the individuals Mm -hmm. is not like we're talking or having a conversation. They are like acting like they're on something, but they're not. You know, Mm -hmm. it's like now one of the things that when I was on County uh, before Massive was really hot and heavy, it was the bath salts is a problem that we Mm -hmm. had before they start trying to pass the loopholes and everything on the laws here in the States, uh, in Kentucky and Indiana, because the ingredients on it, because mm-hmm. uh, every time they pass a law on it, they, the, the salt manufacturer will change the ingredients on the label and they would still manufacture you can buy it in gas stations. And all these kids were dying on it. Mm-hmm. So, but I'm telling you, and I know he can probably speak for himself as well. That yes, there is a difference. And it's like being in a horror movie to where you walk in without the candles, without the scary music. And next thing you know, you're you, you just all of a sudden your hair stands up. You get goosebumps. The air temperature should not change. It does. It gets either colder or it gets hotter. You smell sulfur. You smell burntness, like something's like somebody cooked something and then they burnt it in the oven and nobody's cooked anything because these people don't cook. You know what I'm saying? So, yes, there are a lot of many different indicators. And I'll let him take over as you're starting to get me the creeps. <laughs> <laughs> that's, bring, that's bringing up some gooch yumis on me. So, yeah. So, I, I was at a, I was at a house one night. Uh, with an, with another officer, he wanted to talk to somebody in that house, the occupant of that house. So we went to that house. I only went as a, you know, as a, as a backup. I, I was off to the side, just watching, listening. It, the conversation wasn't between me and the occupant. It was between the occupant and the officer I was there with. And fellas, I'm watching this guy's eyes. And I'm, I'm going to tell you something. I had hair r- raising on the back of my neck when I watched this guy's eyes. His eyes didn't focus on his eyes didn't focus on the officer that came to talk to him. They focused on me, and it was that wild, uh, predatory look in his eyes 
that told me that some, something wasn't right about this guy. And um, he had been involved in another report, supposedly, of a uh, creepy house where, where uh, an officer reported uh, some, some strange things going on in, in that place when he was there uh, for a report. And, um, and while, while he was talking to the officer I was with, uh, I, I caught those eyes looking at me, glaring at me. And I didn't like that. It made me very uncomfortable. It reminded me when I'm, when I'm thinking about that Sasquatch encounter that I had, I've often mentioned that, uh, that I felt as though those eyes were piercing my soul as though uh, it was looking through my soul, through my heart. They've always said that your eyes are, your, are the windows to your heart, to your soul. Yes. And um, I didn't like that because I didn't, give, I didn't give that Sasquatch, I didn't give this man permission to look inside me. That's my business. My business, my business. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right? Gris, Gris, I don't like that. Yeah. And, and I told him when he left that door, I says, Hey, uh, Rick, I said, do you see something wrong there? He says, no, what? I, I didn't see nothing. I mean, you know, he's thinking about eating next. I said, no, I said, there's something wrong here. This, there's something wrong with this gentleman. Look at his eyes. Uh, if you, uh, guys, if you've been around long enough, you know, when you see the eyes, you, you see the eyes of evil, dirty animal that's what you see i said no there's something wrong with this individual well hours later there's a whole there's a whole squad of people going back to that address this guy totally flipped out it takes six officers to hold him down to get him inside a rescue to take him to the hospital to commit him to a mental uh, uh rehab institution there's something involved something wrong here he's been involved in something so, um, as it, as it turns out, uh, an officer went over there on a report that, uh, something strange was going on at a house because the man was taking all his furniture out of his house, loading it up in front of his house for trash pickup. And they wanted to know if this guy was crazy or what was going on in his life that they caused him to empty his house out and put the contents out there in front of the house as though it was, was ready for trash pickup. So the officer goes over there. This is this is what was relayed to me by the officer, and, and and I read the report, so I know this to be factual. So the officer goes over there, and the man, the same man, the same man that I seen, that I complained about, invited the officer into his house, and immediately told him, "Come on downstairs. I want to show you something." They get downstairs. Oh hell no. Uh, uh, nope. <laughs> no, no, he, he no. moves, he moves the rug off the floor in the basement and there's some kind of symbol on the floor. And, um, he says the guy started telling him things that he's seen inside his, his, his apartment. And he wants to move out. He wants to sue the landlord because the landlord didn't tell him about this stuff. He says that he's seen an orb ball go into the oven he was fighting with his his fiance. He's laying on the couch. He sees a he sees an orb ball come up from the basement. It goes through the living room, goes through the dining room, through the kitchen, goes into the oven. And he said, all of a sudden, the glass on the oven blows out, just blows out. He says, then he says he hears men talking, and he's he watches uh, two or three Italian looking men walk out of the basement, walk up the stair stairs from the basement and walk outside he says i don't know where these people came from i i don't there wasn't anybody in my house they just came up from the basement i you know i never seen these people before in my life he says uh at one point he says because people won't believe this he says i thought i would take some pictures of it and he says uh at one time one of these orb balls went behind the curtain do you ever see those commercials on television? Uh, I don't see them anymore, but I used to see them on, on television where uh, I think they were selling uh, some type of uh, medicine, aspirin or something where you you don't feel very good. And um, 
a face and impression comes out of the wall, you know, with the yeah. nose. Yeah. 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 Well, that's what he was. Ex that's what he was describing. He says when the orb went behind a curtain, well, he's seen a face and it scared him and he took a picture of it. So he was showing, showing the officer these pictures and stuff. So this is the same individual who moved out of that location onto another location. And that's where I came in as a uh, backup officer to go to this house. And that's where I seen these, these strange eyes, you know, there's something not right with these eyes. There's something. And I told him, I said, I told the officer, I says, you know, did he come from this other address? Yeah. Oh yeah. He moved from over there, over here. I says, well, I said, brother, I says, here's what I, here, here's what I think. I says, whatever was in that house over here, it's in him and it, yeah. and it's here with him. Now he comes to the door, you're talking to him and he's staring at me with those eyes. And I says, I don't like that. <laughs> I don't like that. I don't want to see anybody looking at me with those eyes. <laughs> yeah. Something like a horror movie or something. It is, you know, and in the in the one thing I can tell you is, in the people that's never experienced that is when you go to a call to service and you're there and you know that when you're talking to somebody and you're looking at somebody and it's about to get real because you can see it in their eyes with their intent, they're getting ready to harm you or do something to you very badly physically, like, you know, maybe try to take your life while you're on duty and I'll leave it at that. But yeah. how many times have you heard officers up on the stand that would testify during when he was trying to grab my gun out of my duty holster? You know, his eyes changed. His yeah. tone of voice changed. Yeah. His demeanor changed. It wasn't he. He was like he was empty. It was not like a human being. Like a and robot. That's why, like yes. A robot. And that's why, you know, our department issue hosters had these saf safety retentions in them to where, you know, if you and I were in a struggle with somebody, they just couldn't pull our firearm out of the hoser right. and yeah. get shot by them, you know. Bruh, I carried, I, I always wore a high rise, high security holster. Yeah. Which, yep. which required a couple movements in order to release that gun. Right. Right. But I, I, had, I the, had the same thing too. And I'd ask people, try to pull a gun out. And and they couldn't do it. No, you know? no, you can't do it without without moving forward and, and yeah, pulling yeah. up. But yeah. uh, uh, I went to the muscle man's house one night, and uh, uh, this guy apparently beat the hell out of his girlfriend badly, badly. And she was a small woman. And he was a pretty pretty good sized boy. But he came to the door wearing bikini briefs. And the officer, you know, that the, the, uh, I was sent to back up. Well, she's she's very, very short. So she's oh. looking at junk. And because he's standing inside his, his house a couple steps up and he's very uh, he's very belligerent with her. And he's got his he's got his arms crossed. He's a muscle man. He means business. He's all oiled down <laughs> with bikini briefs. on, Nonetheless. And I asked him, I says, well, how's, how's your, how's your girlfriend? How's your wife? Well, she's okay. And I says, well, can I talk to her? Can she come to the door? That's all we need to do is see her. And, and she's okay. We've got reports that uh, somebody was screaming somebody's beaten very badly. Yeah. Uh, no, it's not happening. Well, I kind of scooched by him, stepped up on the steps, went by him, uh, took a peek down the hallway and, and I seen this bloodied woman and sitting on the bed and I went in there and, and I told him, I says, uh, you're under arrest for spouse abuse. And the fight was on at that point. Well, uh, you know, I'm struggling with a muscle man, all greased up, all oiled up in his bikini briefs. And, um, I'm looking for my partner and she disappeared on me. She disappeared, left me in there with that, with that mus muscle man. And I'm trying to get cuffs on him. So I only got one cuff on and he's well, he's flailing his arms around and that's a dangerous weapon. Now he's got yeah, the handcuff flinging around. Right. And, um, uh, in the scuffle, the woman that I tried to save and help now she's choking me. She's on my back and she's trying to choke me all full of blood. And, um, 
finally, another officer happened to be driving by and he comes in and it takes him and I both to get him down. But this guy, I'm telling you, the muscle man ripped. He peeled my, my leather holster like a banana peel. He peeled it out and he was trying to pull my gun out. So I had one hand on his hand to keep my gun down because he was going to kill me. And he had one handcuff on. And uh, this is the way it went. But I'm telling you, uh, when, when you talk about stuff that went on out there on the streets and stuff, people don't know. You know, it's, it's easy to judge when you sit back in a, in a, in a nice, comfy uh, leather seat and judge other people. But when you're in the heat of the moment and you're out there uh, dealing with it and stuff, uh, it's very dangerous, very, very dangerous. More so when your partner uh, abandons you. Was that addressed? <clears throat> she, you know, could get, she could get somebody injured or killed. You guys, you guys know, you guys know, you're very familiar with the politics that abound in places like that. I'd let her know uh, off the record. Yeah, you better I not do that, that again. Times. I see no that so many times. Listen, I got I got sent home with a concussion one time. I was I was nearly knocked through a glass a glass plate uh, window, and and God forbid that I didn't go through the window again, trying to save a woman, to protect a woman from being beaten. And um, to this day, I'm retired now, but I got that laceration on my uh, forehead when I hit the window sill. And I'll tell you what, I felt like I, was, I wanted to go to sleep. I had blood all over my face. I felt the, I felt the jello legs. But um, in the heat of the moment, again, this is another one that tries to pull the gun out of my holster. Um, it's not happening. You know, you, you will yourself back on your feet and you tell yourself, I'm not ready to die. This is not going to happen like this. Yeah. And um, that's the way it is. I mean, that's the struggle that uh, you live with. I've got scars on my face. I've got broken bones, broken ribs. I got cement in my back uh, to, to fuse my back together. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a huge price to pay. No sleep, bad appetite, bad diet, stress. It's a huge price to pay for somebody, anybody, men and women both out there on the street. And and, um, and they're making it worse making, on them now. Yeah. yeah. The po politics are making it worse yes. on them now. It's all orchestrated. Uh, yeah, it is. Well, look, I, I'm going to have to say yeah, adios really thank here. Thank you for you coming yeah. on. Thank you, sir. Now, before you go, how do you say uh, that term again? OCO. 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 How do you say? OCO. How do you say? Uh, see you later, Val. <laughs> oh, bro. Uh, yeah, yeah, that is a. Uh, let's oh, see. My God! Oh, my God! <laughs> there we go, ladies and gentlemen. OCO. Okay. All right, and I'll say D Diolahan Daga Lenesca. Adios. Thanks. See you later. Thank you. Bye bye. Wow. That was a good show. Yes, that was a good show. Very interesting. Very good. Very yeah. interesting experiences that Rick OCO, right? OCO. OCO. OCO to you, Chris. Yeah, OCO, man. I tell you, that's uh that, that it's just amazing, you know, it's stuff that we learn. So next week it's gonna be interesting, huh? Well, uh I, I'm waiting to I'm waiting to uh have him on. I've got a lot of questions for him. If if you have any questions about BFRO, you know, you might want to jot them down, Chris. Um, yeah, I, I got some know. questions. So know. Brian put OCO. That is a good way to remember that. OCO. OCO, Brian. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, there we go, ladies and gentlemen. Another edition down for a Sunday. Uh, thanks, Rick. Rick was a great guest. So, 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 Chris, when do you eat supper? I already uh, ate before I came on. So, oh, you yeah. do? Before? Yeah, I did this time. Yeah, Norma, thank you, everybody. Brian, thank you. Jeremiah Sutton, thank you. Hopefully, y'all enjoyed it. OCO, remember that when you're out in the woods, do not go alone. You heard them. Never, never. Yes, I quit doing it. So, we'll catch you on the flip side, ladies and gentlemen. 
Take care. We'll see you. Great ya. time, Chris. Great time. Absolutely, man. I enjoyed it, Val. I'll talk to you soon. All right, my brother. Later. Right, take care. We'll see you guys. Love you all. Bye-bye. It's a grizzly. Should we get out of here? No. We're gonna watch and listen. Action. It's a grizzly. Oh, ship, should we run? <laughs> no. Action. It's a grizzly. Oh, shit. Should we run? <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's a grizzly. Are you sure it's not Jim Monk? <laughs> No, ah, hang out of here. <laughs> it's a grizzly. Oh, I'm out of here. Huh. Maybe it is a chipmunk. <gasps> it's a grizzly. Oh, it. Are we gonna die? I don't know. We're just going to sit here and listen and watch. Let's get out of here, maybe. <laughs> Fall! <laughs> <laughs>